money would be to start? Uh, question was, if you started with a brand new, you know, aren't there 300 people in this room? Well, there's, I bet you outside there's 300 people. Um, if we were to start tonight, how much money would we think we would need? Well, I've got the spreadsheet to tell you that. Um, you could say, my father, it's funny, uh, Peter's compelled me to write this book called Money Grows on Trees, which I, I did promise I'd bring my draft manuscript. It's on my laptop. I didn't print it. I didn't want to kill any trees. <laughs> so, but the amazing thing is I, I interviewed my father who came from Germany in 1953. And he says, I said, I, I want to talk to you about money. He's going to be 80 next week. I said, uh, what was it like when you were in Germany and after the war? And he goes, it was horrible. We were given the Reichmark was worth nothing. And we were given food coupons, but just enough to live. He said, just enough to live, not enough to die. I'm like, really? And then what happened? I did it for two years, and then the, the Marshall Plan came in, and we, they brought in this allied currency, and we had just, a, we had 40, I think 40 marks a month, I think, uh, every, every person. So suddenly the stores were full again, and, and people could consume things, and the factories got going. So I thought, wait a minute, so in his own lifetime, he lived an experience where the amount of money that was created was just enough Right? To fulfill the basic needs, you could, you could design a perfect diet on, on the kil, you know, calories. I can, design the, I can say the living wage of America should be $15 an hour, guaranteed. Nobody should go, go with less. Uh, I can show you that the GDP of the economy needs to only be half of what it is. I've taken out debt and I've taken out waste. You know, a lot of our, our, our fridges and that are have built an obsolescence. Why? Because factories have to, to keep things inventory moving. So you take all, imagine how much efficiency you could squeeze out. And then you can decide, well, maybe the wage should, only needs to be $5 or $10. So we could design the, the exact wage to meet the needs of everyone, at least basic needs. I'm not saying that people shouldn't be allowed to aspire to be Bill Gates. I'm just saying there's something wrong when that doesn't get redistributed from time to time, either. So those are the, those are the comp we could design enough currency to, I said, this earth dollar was sufficient to um, make sure a watershed, and I would plan at the watershed level, all watersheds were healthy. They're producing clean water constantly, regularly. No liabilities, no ecological liabilities are, are you know, chalking up as they are now. All these things could be designed in, in a spreadsheet tonight. It's not hard. I mean, I do it for myself. I do it for my. I do a living wage for our own household. How much, you know, do I need to make as a consultant this year? Right? It's not hard. I can give you my spreadsheet. You're welcome. Well, your last question. I have one then. Okay. Nice. What about all those students' questions? Those are the questions. You don't want me to. You don't want me to call on you, do you? <laughs> <laughs> you pop up. I know where you are, Brandon. Let's go. <laughs> Stand up. Come on, Brandon. <laughs> So one thing I want to compel students is, you know, I don't have all the answers. I think out of our creativity, we can design a way better system. Uh, and we'll, you know, we'll, we won't get it right. I mean, we've, we've been tinkering with this for a long time, right? And what I'm saying, some people say, oh, well, you know, it's like, I guess it's like the Israelites and Moses. Like, oh, what's wrong? The current system might be debt slavery, but what's the alternative? It seems more complicated. You have to make decisions. We have to sit around in circles and decide how much money we create tonight for Cincinnati tomorrow, right? That's what we'd have to do, and that that would be hard. There'd be lots of arguments and 
well, what, why does Susie deserve more? Like she spent seven years studying medicine and, you know, like Joe's just a plumber and, you know, these aren't, these aren't going to be, uh, these would be difficult. And you'd say, well, well it's, I think the current system, there's nothing wrong with it, right? It doesn't, it's not broken. But is it, is it unjust? Is it inefficient? So I think we need to have, begin conversations in the classrooms and the, right, uh, with our kids, right? And, and the, my most important message, just, just be self-aware. Like, and don't take my word. There's lots of stuff on YouTube you can watch um, that tells a more, maybe more eloquent uh, story. But the solutions aren't really that self-evident, at least the practical ones. Obviously, yeah. <laughs> So the question is, what about um, indigenous customs of the potlatch? Uh, and one of the one of the my inspirations is indigenous people. So I work a lot with uh, with indigenous people. And you know, if anyone's ever spent time with elders, spent time in a sweat lodge, you know, gone to a sun dance, gone to a potlatch. I mean, what is what was a potlatch? A potlatch was an over it was it was giving. Uh, to the community from your abundance, and you would prepare a whole year, uh, and your family would prepare a massive feast, and it was a giving. It was just, it was like a joke. It's like, it, it to me, it revealed the truth of the creator's abundance, right? I, I can, I can amass, I'll have the biggest party, right, in the community, and it, but every every household would hold a party, and it would be every every year or whatever the timing was, and. And a lot of that stuff, of course, came from nature anyways. It didn't come from manufactured things, but blankets. And so the, the potlatch was a custom on the West Coast. And so my jacket is from Haida Gwaii, from a woman who does a, you know, Haida Gwaii work. And, and to me, they're my inspiration. Uh, I think I still have one in my pocket. You know, the cowrie shell. You know, when I went, um, I met, anyone ever heard of the Onondaga people? The Iroquois. You know the story of the Iroquois? Do you know who they inspired? Right? Your story, it's, you know, Ben Franklin, right? The Iroquois Confederacy was the model for the colonies. Uh, so I had the pleasure a year and a half ago of going to the Longhouse and meet Chief Warren Lyons, 83-year-old uh, uh, spirit, um, Turtle Clan uh, chief and leader of uh, spiritual leader of the Onondaga people. And the Onondaga people live on the sacred lake Onondaga, near Syracuse, the most toxic lake in America, super fun site. And they said, we've invited you here because we think you can help clean Lake Onondaga. He says, we're going to help you clean up. I'm not, right? And so the beauty of meeting Oren was we walked in that longhouse and we were totally, we were driven five day, five hours from New York. And we were invited in, and Oren had a sit down across. So the longhouse is very long. There's 50 clans. And I knew that I was, I had arrived in paradise because this culture was still a matriarchal culture. The women elect the chiefs for life, and they have the right of recall. So we walk in, and I, I'm looking. I'm looking at all the scenery. So there's f f 50, you know, osprey headdresses on the wall. The chiefs are at the front, and the guests sit over here, and the women are over here. And there's a table in the middle of the hall, and there it is, the the double, double row wampum belt. The wampum belt was the, the wampum treaty with George Washington, was a treaty that said as long as the rivers flow, our two people will journey together. That wampum belt hadn't had been stored in the New York Museum of Natural History or something, and it had just come back. And then he told us, you're actually not allowed to be in our longhouse because we're in the middle of a 30-day ceremonial period. I'm like, oh my goodness, what? We drove like 
five hours and he's just gonna send us back to New York. And then he kind of smiled and goes, just kidding, we'll meet you at the hockey rink, we'll buy you lunch. <laughs> like, you know, they have such a great sense of humor. But Orrin is one of the few guys that knew the story of the Wizard of Oz. He said, you know, Mark says, you know that the, the flying monkeys was us, Indians. The wicked witch of the West was Mother Nature. They had to ground the, the monkeys, right? And the Homestead Act of Lincoln, right, took the land, conquered the West. So anyways, the, the point is this, this wampa belt, what was it, a bunch of seashells sewn onto fabric or buckskin, which again represented, it would be like piling all the gold of Cincinnati onto a table and saying, come, set the, you know, it's like a joke. So I'm, I'm inspired by indigenous people. I think they will lead it. They're like our monasteries. I think the few, you know, we killed most of them off, right? And they became alcoholics. We abused them in schools and just horrible. And yet they're like, they're like these children who, were, who came out from the Garden of Eden, never left it. And we came here and destroyed it with our money power. You know, and the, the story is the same in America as it's in Canada. It's a horrible story. But yet they're still around. And they have these legends that the Tree of Life still exists and we're going to find the few people who still know where it is will know how to get back to it. So I have the pleasure of hosting. I, now I get to host circles on the land. And our last circle in Edmonton, we called it the Circle Wampum, because that's Warren Lyons' vision of what's going to happen. No longer that two-row wampum, it's going to be a circle wampum. Right? That's the future. And so I'm helping them achieve financial sovereignty, because they're smaller, like 300 people, some of them. I can design, they're, and they're called nations, by the way. There's 640 First Nations in Canada. I'm helping them design new money systems, interest-free banking, asset-based right economy. They can do it. That's why I'm so pumped. You know, 300 million Americans—that's too much. Like, but 300, you know, enlightened. This was not the land of Utopia. <laughs> Anyways, thank you for the question because I'm inspired by them. So. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. One more, and then we're gonna wrap it up. two or three steps that are doable uh, me means I have to come down from 30,000 feet, as Peter knows. It's hard. Like The air gets thinner when I get them down. But uh, <clears throat> I mean, I have to say that I know in my, own, in my own life, I can only speak from my experience, is you know, getting out of debt. Um, uh, trying to, you know, it's an old adage, try to live within your means. Like, don't encourage your kids to get addicted to credit and, you know, learn how to save again. Um, you know, all the, all the pressures and problems of the macro system will still exist. Um, let's start talking about money. Uh, let's, let's form these conversational circles. Let's refinancing our neighbors' debts if we can, right? Why, why are neighbors paying 18, 24% on their credit cards? when well, it's completely ridiculous. And, are, and they're, maybe they're ashamed to talk about it. So let's start with our neighbors. Let's start in our neighborhoods. Um, I think that's what we're, we're trying to do. That's what you're trying to do in Cincinnati. So join those, uh, join the economics of compassion. You're, you're part of it already, I bet. Not yet? Sort of? On the sideline? Come, you know, join us. We've got two days of this conversation, right? Coming up? That's the perfect segue, right? Yeah, it's a good segue to the promo for the rest of the week. Join Thank you. Me, uh, please join me in thanking Mark Agnielski for his talk today. Truly some new ideas. So thanks, and, and we do hope to see many of you at the Neighborhood Economics Conference tomorrow and Wednesday, taking place all day at Xavier's Gallagher Theater. And stay tuned for spring semester events here and Economics of Compassion events, including uh, we'll be having uh, another Jubilee lecture at the Clifton Mosque on December the 3rd, is that correct, at 6.30 p.m. So that's the the next event in the Jubilee series. Thank you all for coming.